everyone, and welcome to this, the 11th episode of The Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice, and glad that you're with us. We have a lot to talk about again today, and joining us, we'll have Doug O'Neill, the two-time derby-winning trainer from NBC Sports, Donna Brothers, and a multiple Emmy Award-winning news anchor, Nancy Cox, from the NBC affiliate in Lexington, Kentucky, talking about what a big deal the Kentucky Derby is for anybody that's in the media in the state of Kentucky during Derby Week. All that is coming up. Glad that you're with us. Uh, a really interesting time in sports. Auburn and Texas Tech are both going to the Final Four. It's the first time in the history of the programs that they have made it that far in the college basketball tournament, as if you needed an explanation of what the Final Four is, because roughly $8.5 billion are bet over a three-week period on the NCAA basketball tournament. And if you're a Duke and Kentucky and North Carolina fan, you're probably a little upset along the way. But that's what we like, upsets and surprises. And in horse racing, last weekend in the Florida Derby, one of the bigger upsets of this season, a horse coming literally out of nowhere named Maximum Security posted an impressive victory in the Florida Derby and is now vaulted into the top 10 of uh, just about every poll. And in the latest Kentucky Derby pool, which will end uh, this coming weekend around the 4th or 5th of April, uh, he is now the co-favorite at 8-1 to one with game winner. That shows how unpredictable it's been right now on this derby scene is one race can change everything. And that's what it's done for Jason Service, the trainer of Maximum Security. We're going to talk about him in just a moment. I want to talk about upsets a little bit. And, of course, with us is researcher Mr. Thomas Kenny. Gosh, your title just keeps growing, doesn't it? Yeah. Hopefully I'll get a doctorate soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> and on keyboard is Ben Chaffins. Ben, do you have do you want Mr. Ben Chaffins? You know, I think I'll go informal. Okay, you'll be informal. Upsets we're talking about. Do you have a favorite upset or one that kind of stands out that's pretty cool upset in any kind of sport? Well, I've talked about it a few times before, but the 2008 Super Bowl 42, I believe it was. Yeah. Giants versus the Patriots. The Patriots were undefeated that season. Yep. You know, you'd have to be a madman to pick against them, right? Right. But you did because you're a Giants fan. That's right. Yeah, that was huge. I don't guess we have time to reenact our David Tyree catch in the past. We've done that before. You can look it up. It was like episode three or something like that. Ben, what's your favorite sports moment upset? Well, Kenny, I'd have to go with the uh, 1980 U.S. hockey team. Ah, do you believe in miracles beating Russia? Yeah, beating the Soviet Union, as it was at that time. That was huge. Al Michaels' brilliant call of that. Indelibly etched in our minds, do you believe in miracles? Which is used now in a lot of things, right? You know, they didn't win the gold medal, by the way, on that one. That was not the gold medal game. It was a semifinal game. That's right. But it was such a big upset. That's the one they remember most. How about that? Yeah, I guess context goes a lot way. Yeah, you like the? Did you like the movie? Did anybody ever see the mu movie Miracle on Ice? Right? Or, yeah. Or Miracle, just Miracle, I think. Miracle. And it's a good movie. But it's got Kurt Russell in it. If Kurt Russell's in a movie, it's good. If he's ever watching this show, come on anytime. Anything Kurt Russell does is good. Escape from New York to Miracle to uh, Sticky but Overboard, a, ro a rom com that the. People like out there. It's a good date movie. Yeah, it's stick stick Kurt Russell in anything. He's he's a tre tremendous actor. All right, now back to upsets and surprises. Oh, my, mine by the way. You wonder what mine is, Mr. Thomas Kenny? What would that be, Kenny? Thank you for asking. Unsolicited over there. Uh, that would be, and I was at that game, 1985 NCAA championship because I love basketball. Villanova knocked off Georgetown, and Georgetown with Patrick Ewing, they just looked unbeatable. Villanova wasn't even supposed to be there. Rolly Massimino was their coach and done a terrific job, and they won that game and shot just a crazy 70-some percent in the second half. I mean, it was close to not missing for a long time for Villanova. They had to play the perfect game, and they did. So that, that really was one of my favorite sports upsets, that and the fact that I was there covering it. You know, that was my, uh, I guess, first Final Four that I covered, so that made it really fun to watch. But now maximum security, and this is the great thing that I think makes horse racing so endearing to a lot of people out there is that, you know, you can have these surprises. You can have these horses you didn't expect. Not only that, but in December 20th, 
any of us out there could have purchased maximum security for $16,000. That was it. You could have gotten a bunch of buddies. You could got 16 buddies chipping in a thousand apiece. You could own the, a derby contender right now. Maximum security is put in a claiming race. And of course they put them in claiming races. Sometimes they're hoping somebody will take the horse off their hand. And that's the claiming price, $16,000. In this case, Jason service, the trainer has said that, uh, he really didn't think anybody wanted the horse. It was kind of like, yeah, maybe we'll take a look at him. The horse won the race big. No one claimed him, which they'd have to do before the race. You can't wait till after the fact and say, hey, he looks pretty good. But nobody claimed him. They had their shot. Not really impressed with the pedigree or the way he had been doing. And instead now he has jumped to the Florida Derby win and in the points leaderboard, he's right there at the top of Churchill Downs. But that $16,000, you know, that's a good price. But Thomas... From your research, uh, there's some derby winners that have been in that ballpark, uh, even some just a little less than that, and and some are very famous derby winners that, heck, you could get in paltry terms compared to most of the prices in, paid in the sport of kings. Mm -hmm. Coming in at $17,000, which is just you know one grand higher than maximum security, uh, that was real quiet in 1998. Wow. Derby winner. Mind that bird, 2009, four digits, $9,500. <laughs> wow. And going as far back as 1971, Cannonero II sold for a measly $1,200. Wow. Back, of course, you have to adjust for inflation, but to think back then you could have owned a derby winner for $1,200. Oh that's pretty insane. That That is. It's it's like, you, you know, and that, that's what entices people. Hey, let's all chip in on a derby horse. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Six figures is generally what you have to pay. Right. But, uh, there, you know, there's some other bargains in there that people probably heard about. Like, I'll have another. We're going to talk to his trainer in a few minutes. What did mm -hmm. he go for? He was uh, the 12 Derby champ. A little bit more expensive than the others on the list, but, you know, $35,000. Yeah. Still pretty low, all things considered. Less than most cars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, an average car, you don't even have to fix it up. You know, used to uh, soup it up a little bit. Nah, that's 35 grand. That's about what you pay for a car most places these days. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but Canyon Arrow the second, 1200 bucks. Wow. There's some bargains in there. Funny side was 22,000. Mm -hmm. You did extensive research this week, didn't you? It took a little while, but I think it was worth it. Well, let's mention some others in there then. Um, Seattle Slough. Yeah. 1977. The Triple Crown winner, Seattle Slough. Triple How? Crown winner for 17.5. Now that is the bargain of all time. A Triple Crown winner and one of the great horses of all time. 17.5. Doesn't seem possible, does it? It's it's ludicrous when you when you say it out loud. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it is. Who knows? One day we'll talk maybe about maximum security. I'm sure we're going to talk about him leading into the Derby, uh, going for that. Could have had him for that price of sixteen. Could have had him for that price. Uh, but you know what it proves is they say you can't buy love and you can't buy a Derby winner. I don't know who said that. I just said that. Write that down, Ben. Put that on a bumper sticker and let's attribute it to the sports to the horse racing show. Okay. You got it. Yeah. Because there's only been one horse that sold for a million dollars, not earned a million dollars on the way, because they can do that now with a Breeders' Cup win or something. Only one horse that sold at auction for $1 million or more, in this case it was $4 million, has won the Kentucky Derby. That was Fusaichi Pegasus in 2000. You know, you think about that, because you think it's all based on potential. It's like the NBA draft has become. It's not necessarily are you good, it's your potential. And that's where the horse sale is anyway, it's the potential, who their mommy and daddy is, how they may look. Uh, but you'd think that a million-dollar purchase somewhere out there would have won a Kentucky Derby other than Fusa H. E. Pegasus, wouldn't you, Thomas? Yeah. I mean, it just goes to show how you know volatile the sport can be. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of intrigue for people, and that's the fun side of it. Some of the negative side, of course, is uh, sadly another horse died at Santa Anita this week. Its number is 23 now, a number we don't like to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk, though, about it, uh, what's going on out there, get a little better perspective from a guy who is based there. It's his home base. He's the two-time winning Kentucky Derby winning trainer. I think I said winning twice. 
That's Sorry, redundant. We'll let it slide. That's redundant, redundant, isn't it? But he is a two-time Derby winning trainer who had I'll have another and Nyquist and Doug O'Neill. He will join us. Donna Brothers, Nancy Cox coming up later on. We'll have the Rudin Riddle vet check. It's all right here on this, the horse racing show. Stay with us. And welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. Thank you for tuning in on the YouTube channel and subscribing and liking us. And again, thanks for listening at iTunes and at Google Play, listening to us on 93.9 The Ville in Louisville and all around the world. We've been downloading like 10 different countries or so now. We appreciate the support because this is a fun show, the show that's going to save horse racing. A fun guy to have on, a great trainer, and he's been a great friend, two-time derby winner, Doug O'Neill, such a good guy that he's driving on the five, Hands-free, of course, and he's talking to us now. We join him from uh, Southern California. Hi, Doug. Hello, Kenny. Thanks for having me. Oh, man, it's always great to talk to you this time of the year. You still have a couple of long shots out there. Not everybody's in the derby scene every year. You know what it's like to win those roses. And uh, I don't know, from from a standpoint of a, of a guy that has a long shot, do you still get excited keeping up with everybody else right now? Oh, you do. It is such a great time of year, you know, it's the uh, – uh, these three-year-olds now they start stretching out and they start separating themselves and people are going on the road and you know some of the horses really thrive on traveling some don't and you know baseball season starting up too so it's just it's a great time of year and and uh yeah thinking about the kentucky derby gets uh, you really jacked up whether you have a horse in there or not as far as yourself uh you know with i'll have another and nyquist your two champions uh, I guess just the whole time, you, you still think back to those times and how you were feeling around April, just about a month away from the Derby, and you certainly had horses that looked like could do it, but you still were hoping. You remember yeah, that feeling? You know, you, yeah, oh, I do, I do, yeah. And, uh, you know, with the first one, uh, that was just such a wacky roller coaster, like, oh, my God, I can't believe what just happened where uh, with I'll have another. But um, with Nyquist, he was – undefeated and you know there was even though we enjoyed every step of the way with both of them but there's a lot more pressure on the Nyquist uh you know he was uh, voted the two-year-old champion and um you know he was definitely expected to to, to show up in the first Saturday of May and expected to win and and uh, that made it uh, a little bit more uh, <laughs> a little bit more stressful but but uh it just it's a great feeling and it's really uh as we talked off the air a little bit, you know, a lot of turmoil on the West coast. And, you know, when you get to, when you roll into Kentucky, you know, you, you're really, uh, you're just so proud to be part of the game. And it's just, the uh, there's just no better event than having your horse being part of the Kentucky Derby. Well, two of my most fun interviews were with, I'll have another in Nyquist with you. I remember your son, especially with, uh, I'll have another. Cause I was sick that day. I wasn't feeling great. Okay. And then I'm kind of <laughs> a little sweaty and it's hot. And I come over and your son wants a hot tub. <laughs> oh, he's a nut. He's such a nut. Yeah, man. Daniel, he's 16 now. Is he 16? Wow. He's 16. Yeah, he's, uh, you know, he's getting good solid C's in school. So proud of him on that. Uh, but um, <laughs> he'll probably be a trainer. He'll be, uh, he'll be one of the sharper trainers. Yeah. <laughs> 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 he'll be in the upper echelon won't he <laughs> oh man he will but no he, he loves the sport loves the animals and during the summer he helps us out he's been uh walking hots and stuff for us at del mar during the summer so um yeah th those are good times good times to think back on i believe you're a michigander who moved to southern california near san anita right and used to walk hots at del mar is that right yeah, yeah, yeah. I moved uh, at age ten. Moved from Sa uh, moved from Detroit, just outside of Detroit and Dearborn, Michigan, to uh, Santa Monica. And yeah, like the first weekend we were here, my dad uh, didn't take us to Disneyland and said he took us to Santa Anita. And uh, <laughs> man, I mean, you still can't uh, you can't beat that backdrop of Santa Anita with San Gabriel Mountains and it's just you know reeks of so much amazing history and and um, it's just a beautiful venue and. A beautiful facility and we're hoping to uh have a great weekend this uh weekend with sandia derby hopefully everything um is uh just going to be a good show and and a great day yeah i hope so too and uh yeah so let me ask you because that's home track for you uh yeah 
I know right now you're on the five because you also have horses at San Luis Rey and, and other places, as several trainers do out there. But what's been yep. the general feeling on the backstretch uh, among the trainers and everybody involved, Doug? I, I guess the most frustrating thing from a distance looking at it all is we, there's some good theories, but I don't know if anybody's able to been to pinpoint what's happened with these horses breaking down. And I was just kind of curious about the overall feeling out there during all this. Yeah, you know, it's uh, <laughs> it's everybody is obviously very distraught and upset about the, the loss of, of the number of horses that we've had. But, um, you know, I think everyone's on the same page as far as, um, you know, what what the changes they have made, the, the, the track, knock on wood, is as good as it's ever been. And, uh, you know, we um, unfortunately in December – the track superintendent Dennis Moore left and then uh, the rain, we had probably the, the wettest winter I can recall in a long time. I mean, just days on days on days of just the rain coming down sideways. And, um, you know, and we ran through that. And I, I think there's a lot of stuff as we look back, you know, I, I think all of us horsemen uh, in management would have agreed, uh, would agree that, you know, maybe we uh, shouldn't have run on some of those days, but, Regardless, we got Dennis Moore, the, the track superintendent, back. We've got our normal, beautiful Southern California weather back. And, you know, our tracks out here really play more to sunshine than they do to, to the wet weather. It doesn't have the sand buildup that the East Coast and Midwest tracks have. So, um, you know, I just – right now, things are going well. We had an incident the other day coming down the hill, was which was horrible. But, uh, you know, I, I think we're all just staying really strong and, and – um, you know, we're doing everything uh, we can to, to be proud of our sport and be proud and, and to show everyone how we're here to serve our, our beautiful animals. And, and uh, you know, it doesn't come without risk, of course. Uh, but, um, you know, horse and jockey are, are the, the main uh, importance. And, and I applaud, uh, you know, everyone in the, the business for everyone's been kind of pulling together and realizing we're all in this together and we just need to be a you know, a strong voice. I heard a gentleman named Nick Luck from England, just a really bright, articulate fella. Yes, I work uh, with Nick. Yes. Oh man, he you got to let he just did an interview, and I was like, whoa! It just really floored me. You know, he was just so much more articulate than I am right now. But just about how we all need to get together and um, and be one voice, and uh, you know, for whatever reason, we've been kind of bending back and forth and listening to, you know, some small, small group get rid of racing. And we're trying to like get their opinion of what do you think's wrong with racing? And, and really at the end of the day, you know, we've got to be respectful, but uh, of those small little groups, but we got to, we got to say what's really great about our industry and what's great about our sport and what we're doing to uh, protect uh, horse and rider on a daily basis. So, um, yeah, I, I would love to hear more on have Nick Luck uh, and you, Kenny, uh, speak more on the, what, what's great about our sport and what we're doing to continually, continuously uh, become safer and better and and, uh, and just go in the right way. That's why we have guests like two-time Derby winner Doug O'Neill on this show. I like to get people to know about who you guys are as opposed to just seeing you in the winter circle, which is always a great place to see you. But, you know, my take on it is, and I told some of these guys a long time ago, as you know, I've covered a couple other sports that uh, some yeah. would consider brutal, MMA and boxing. And, yeah. uh, you know, my theory is, especially with MMA, I think horse racing needs to get a bit like that. In other words, just come right out there and say, this is what we do. A lot of people like us. Things can happen. There is danger in the sport, but there's also excitement and fun, and this is what we do Please come and enjoy it with us. I'd almost like to it. see that unapologetic approach for a while. I know you can yeah. overdo it, but obviously what's happened at Santa Anita, nobody wants this. I can't even believe people who don't like horse racing wants to see what's happened to prove a point they don't like horse racing. So to me, it's sad. It's happened. Do you dwell on it or you try to move forward? That's probably not Correct. as articulate as our friend Nick would yeah. say or you, but... No. To me, I think there does have to be that point that you don't say we're changing all the racing rules and we've just thrown out whips and nobody can ever use Lasix again. Forget that. Be the sport that it is. 
and accept yeah. that and say this is what we are. And by the way, uh, you want to get excited and talk about the danger sports and sports that you know that fire up young people instead of worrying about them betting so much. How about come out and watch these jockeys that are racing at 40 miles an hour about uh, half a foot apart? That's a pretty exciting thing to enjoy. And then learn the sport and then bet. Gee, did I just do a commercial for the NTRA? <laughs> You really did. That was great. No, you, and that's really, I think, the way we need to approach it. And then, of course, uh, you know, have um, you know uh, uh, some type of medication unifying, you know, national, right. yeah. you know, so everyone's on the same page because that can get really goofy too. Where you know what is legal in Pennsylvania isn't legal here, and what's legal here isn't legal there. It's like what <laughs> you know, so. Just trying to get one voice, have all of us pulling together and, and all of us um, re reminding each other and reminding people who don't know much about it what, what's great about it. And that's that's key. I, I would vote for you as one of those guys oh. speaking. I mean, we need a commissioner yeah. or something. Seriously, they need to get that straightened out a little bit. But let me get back my to My votes the, for you for you and Nick Nick uh, Luck are, are my two you two guys. Well, you know uh, what? It would be a it would be a yin and a yang, wouldn't it? I mean he's yeah, a little more diplomatic be, than me about this, but uh I do think so You can put him in a headlock. You can put the people in a headlock and he can kinda <laughs> it, <laughs> he can kinda use his words to kinda soften the blow a little bit. <laughs> Good cop, bad cop. Welcome to there horse we racing. Uh, I remember when I first uh, met you we talked about the Tigers because I used to go to Old Tiger Stadium. I have relatives yeah. that live in Dearborn and all throughout that area. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, there's just something about this time of year. The Final Four is coming up and baseball, and we're yeah. getting closer to figuring out who's going to be a good derby contender, who's for real or not. Uh, and you're yeah. such a sports fan. I know you got to appreciate everything going on right now. Yeah, man, I do. God, it's, uh, <laughs> there's not enough TVs to have all the different uh, events on. Then I've even, you know, we've got a lot of uh, – owners and friends and uh stuff in in nh in the nhl and we've got um eric uh, johnson with colorado avalanche has got a few horses with us and uh he's they're fighting for a playoff spot so you got hockey playoffs coming up so it really is it's a great great time of year for for uh, sports fans that's my, for sure my goodness how you had a horse that won the derby named nyquist how could i have left hockey out <laughs> What's wrong with me? Uh, I know. Well, probably the way the wings are playing. <laughs> we don't talk much about hockey right now. You know, that was struggling. my favorite team because of my relatives in Dearborn. The wings were my favorite uh, team. I didn't grow up a hockey fan, uh, but I always kind of kept up with them. Well, they, all, they got the coolest uniforms. They, they got a do. great tradition, great they history, do. man. Yeah, they're they're, uh, they're they're fun to watch, even in their as they're struggling now. But they'll bounce back here real soon with some young prospects coming. And, you know, as my late uncle always liked to talk about the Gordy Howe hat trick you know yeah. what a goal assist oh, yeah. and a fight you know that's, <laughs> that's what i love about hockey I like that. and, and what, oh, what yeah. about all these hockey guys you know eddie olchek's our friend a colleague of mine as well uh what about these hockey guys how come there's not more need to get some more like nba guys and stuff coming in too they all these hockey guys maybe a few baseball guys that are buying into the sport i know i know you know i think uh that's a good good question um we, we've got um Janie Buss, whose family, the, the Buss family, owns yeah. the Lakers. Uh -huh. And Janie's got a handful of horses with us, and she don't, donates any of their earnings to uh, military uh, charities, which is so cool of her. And, and uh, so, no, it would be cool to get um, some NBA guys. We had uh, Kobe Bryant and uh, Pau Gasol That's right. own like 5% of a couple horses, uh, or one horse, 5% each of a horse at Heller Park years ago. And I never did get to meet. Well, I met Kobe at a charity thing, but Powell would actually come to the barn area. Paul Gasol is a huge <laughs> yeah. horse-loving guy. He always huge, literally, too, but he's a big uh, lover of horses, that's for sure. Well, there's no more fun barn than the Doug O'Neill barn, uh, uh, wherever. And, you know, your brother Dennis <laughs> is great at just seeing horses and picking them out. And uh, you all have been a great team over the years. And just everybody kind of comes around your barn, seems to have fun. You even let our mutual friend Rex Chapman come by your barn, see? So yeah, yeah. Uh, You welcome Rex all. Is my man. You welcome oh, all. I've known, <laughs> I've known Rex since he was the high school star. I covered him way back when. That's how long Rex, Rex and I. Uh, oh, man, Rex in Kentucky. I remember uh, people saying that. But, yeah, he, he was an absolute stud. He's such a – he's still a dear friend of mine as well. I – talk to him probably once a month through texting and we'll call every now and then but he was out here in california for a while and just uh 
great human being, awesome basketball player. And yeah, I think his handle is like hoops and horses. He loves, uh, yeah. Horses as much as he loves hoops. So he's, he's a great, uh, uh ambassador for our sport and, and, uh, great, great man. Well, you know, you do, you seem to have athletes and people gravitate to you. Uh, Rick Pitino has been in on some horses yeah. or at least one that I know of, uh, yeah. and, you know, and, and, uh, the hockey guys we talked about. And, and I think that's probably because, you know, you know, Baffert knows a lot, uh, you know, Lucas or all you guys are sports fans too. And I think that helps a lot. You can talk a lot yeah. about sports and identify with them where it's not always about he worked 58 and two this morning. Well, yeah, you know, I, it's been a, a real uh, amazing perk, you know, being able to be part of horses like I'll have another Nyquist definitely opens up the door to meet some cool people like uh, the Rex Chapman's and the coach Patino's and the Eric Johnson's and the, you know, uh, sports guys that you get to meet. So, um, you know, and uh, God, I got to meet, uh, Joe Torrey uh, as well. He's a huge uh, racing fan. Get to meet him at Del Mar. And uh, Del Mar tends to bring a lot of Drew Brees uh, is down there. Luke Walton. You'll see a lot of sports guys at Del Mar the first weekend or two as well. So it's a, it's a lot of similar, you know, uh, I think feel of, of horse racing and other sports. Just the, like you said, the excitement, the plotting, the planning, uh, you know, and, and it's basically every race is like, uh, you know, fourth down and one and you know fourth <laughs> yeah. and goal at the one type of thing so it's a lot of excitement going on and and uh yeah hopefully new people can come out enjoy it and, and get bit by the bug like you and i have kenny and, and you know doug obviously you've been there in that winter circle twice there's something about a kentucky derby and that walkover and 160,000 yeah. people there i don't know of any other sport i guess a super bowl maybe running out on the field for a super bowl but very few yeah. very few things are like that moment when you're going to the paddock and everybody's cheering you on and even the guy that has a 50 to one shot thinks well maybe i could be mine that bird today maybe i could pull it off you know there's that uh, yeah. hope and excitement of a walk over at the derby it really is i mean so much goes into it you're so proud to be connected you know have that uh, connection with a horse that is that good that can make that field and then uh like you say you just have so much shared experience with a lot of fans that are, are wagering and sporting your horse on that particular moment and everyone's dressed uh, you know um in their derby uh finest and it's just it really is it's the most amazing and then as you walk over there like you say the roar of the crowd and the twin spires it's just yeah. it, it, it gives you goosebumps man it's a it's a great feeling well, you, you have a couple of long shots. Who knows? I mean, honestly, after maximum security, nothing's off the table as far as I'm concerned with a month ago. Still got, uh, I got a horse named Parsimony that uh, is supposed to run in the bluegrass this weekend. So if he were to get uh, a big piece of that, he would he would be heading there. And then uh, a horse named One Flew South is running the following weekend in the Arkansas Derby. So, um, yeah, if One Flew South or Parsimony could shock the world and one of those two will will be uh we'll have a participant well we no one was talking about maximum security a week ago so well, yeah. exactly i mean these these three-year-olds change uh really quickly so we're hoping one of our two uh jumps up and and changes in a great way doug it's always a pleasure i look forward to seeing you in person thanks for being on with me you too man thanks for having me kenny all the best look forward to seeing you too man all right, thanks so much. One Hi, of the brother. great guys Bye. in the sport, Doug O'Neill, two-time Kentucky Derby winning trainer with I'll Have Another in 12 and in 16 with Nyquist. Coming up, Donna Brothers from NBC Sports will join us. You're watching the Horse Racing Show. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. Thank you for logging on and liking us on YouTube and watching, and then on iTunes and Google Play, Facebook, following us at Horse Racing on Twitter. Great to have this person with me. She's one of my favorite people, longtime friend, even though she probably won't admit it, a pioneer in her own right, a trailblazer, even though it's been over 20 years since she has ridden. She is still among the top four in all-time money earning among female jockeys, and you probably know her best with NBC Sports. She is Donna Brothers. Hello, Donna. 
Hello, am I not going to admit to being your longtime friend or did all the other accolades? Well, maybe the longtime <laughs> friend. I don't know if you want to admit how long we know each other. And you know what I was thinking is, I don't know the last time I interviewed you. I guess we interview each other all the time on the on the Triple Crown Trail. What do you think? What do you think? This and that. But I actually interviewed. True. Yeah, how about that? Yeah, yeah. that's true. I mean, you know, <laughs> the, the very first show we ever did together, I'm sure you remember it, but I remember it well because it was my first show, really. It was yeah. the uh, ESPN jockey championship out in um texas and you saved me that's what i remember ah, because you're kind. i kind of got thrown to the wolves on that show i'd never done a broadcast television show at all and you just made everything go seamlessly and you would throw me softballs and if i dropped them you would just pick them up and nobody would even <laughs> notice so thank you for that kenny I uh, owe you. you're, you're God, that was 100 years ago you're, you're much too kind and people ask me all the time how does donna do those interviews those great interviews on horseback right after the race, and I say, because only Donna can do them, I don't know. I certainly would be afraid to even be near a horse, much less trying to ride one with a bunch of great horses that just finished the race. I'd be, they'd throw me, I'd be bumping into people, they'd, exp, they'd expel me from racetracks everywhere. You know, that's a lot to think about. You're riding, uh, the, the guy you're talking to is, is, you know, out of breath and excited, he's just won the race. There's a lot going on, and you've got to be able to, you know, whip out the, one of the 20 jockeys or 18 or however many's in the derby or one of the big races. Yeah, you know, I will say for me it's easier to be on the horse than to do a stand-up hit per se. Like, if I'm going to stand there and just do a hit over by the paddock, then I have to wonder about, well, what do I do with a hand that's not holding the microphone? What do I do? Do I stand like this, or should I lean against something? And so for me that part was always you know in the beginning especially to do a stand-up piece i didn't know what to do with the rest of my body but if you put me on a horse my body knew what to do with the rest of my body <laughs> so it diffused any nervous energy that i might have had and helped me actually to concentrate more on the the task at hand which was a conversation and you know you and mike Battaglia and tom hammond have been my mentors at nbc over the years and one of the things that you all have impressed upon me is that how important it is to make it a conversation. So it's one thing to have your questions in mind and have a whole direction of the way you think you'd like for it to go. But I really feel like the best interviews come from the ones that turn into uh, something that seems like a conversation someone's overhearing rather than a sort of a staged interview. And, and Kenny, you do that very, very well. But so the, the thing that I do on horseback looks difficult to everybody who has never ridden horses professionally. But since I've rode horses professionally <laughs> for 26 years, it's actually easier for me. <laughs> well, you mentioned a key word, and, and that's why, among other Sports Illustrated named you the sideline reporter of the year about three or four years ago, is there is a conversation afterwards. It, it's not the basic, well, what do you think? How do you like that? What about your ride? I mean, those are kind of the basic things that you don't ask, which makes it always interesting because if I'm with the winner, I'm listening closely to what you're getting from the jockey than things that I can also incorporate with the trainer, perhaps, that I hear or something. And I do the same thing. So sometimes they come to you guys with the trainer first. And so it, it behooves me to listen to what was just said so that I can say, well, Baffert had just told Kenny Rice that he felt like the first half mile fraction might been a, might have been a little quick. What mm -hmm. were you thinking at that point? And so it does help that we, you know, not only listen to the people that we're interviewing, but listen to each other and feed off of each other. But it's a fun gig, Kenny. Right? Oh, oh, it is. <laughs> There's nothing like the Derby. And I'll bet right now you're preparing for 20 jockey interviews, aren't you? Because at the way it's shaping up, and I know Santa Anita and, and uh, Bluegrass, Arkansas, big races still coming up. But after this Florida Derby. I think it's just it just really opens everything up. Maybe Baffert still has the best too. I don't know, but you know when maximum security comes out of the blue, I didn't have him on my radar. I don't think many people did until the Florida Derby. No, as you know, we do this NTRA top ten poll for the uh, top three year old and top thoroughbred yeah. each week, and um, I had said right after the race that the part that embarrasses me it's that that horse was so impressive impressive he's gonna have to go in my top 10 and he has never even been on my radar <laughs> i've never heard of this horse until this week yeah. and so i went back and looked at the ntra top 10 polls and he had not made like the top 30 of the ntra cut so he wasn't on anybody's radar but the kind of race that he put together yeah you he's a serious contender now yeah, and, and, you know, to me, Donna, I, I think this is a good thing. We've had this string of favorites, and maybe a favorite will do it again this year. Obviously, I wish I knew right now, but who does? Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I kind of like this. I kind of like this wide openness in some ways. Uh, you never know who's going to pop up. 
you know, maybe maybe we'll have that long shot again. I think it at least is appealing out there to the viewers and those that'll be at the track is, do we have that super horse coming in? Do we have a Pharaoh or justify looking one? And maybe we'll have one after the Derby, after Santa Anita this weekend with game winner. I don't know that yet, but I, I do like that underdog uh, role that some of these horses may be coming into the Derby with. Yeah. And you know, when you go back and look at the rebel stakes, which I did this morning, um, but both divisions of the rebel stakes, it's easy to see that improbable and game winner. Number one, both got a lot out of the race and number two, probably both needed the race. They broke, both broke just a step slow, which I think was a, a indication or, or just a, a side effect of having been off for so long and not having raced in the last couple months. And so they both broke just a step slow, put them both into positions that they didn't want to be in. Game winner ended up eating more dirt, being shuffled back further than he had before. Improbable ended up being wide around both turns because of his slow break from that outside post. But then if you look at long, long range toddy and Omaha beach, the two horses who beat Baffert's favorites in the rebel stakes, those are real horses too. I mean, Omaha beach ran an amazing race. He's a beautiful, good looking horse trained by Richard Mandela was ridden by Mike Smith and then long range toddy. If you go back and look at all of his races, he doesn't have a bad race and John court rode an amazing ride, but long range toddy put him in a position to do it. And so, yes, like you, you know, it, it's always easier for us if we can just go, oh, yeah, the, these are the two horses to beat, and yeah. that's it. But right now, we're pretty deep on who the horses are to beat. I, I think it's going to make for a, for a fun time in it all. And I, I want to ask you, because you're so astute and you have an opinion and you're candid, and that's among the many things I like about you, is uh, with the whole Santa Anita issue, and I don't want to get into about the track and all. We, you know, we've talked that so many times in the, on no, this show. No, we don't show. have an hour on this show. No, anyway, no, yeah, anyway. yeah. And then, you know, and, and <laughs> I want to bring in landscapers, soil specialists, you know, it gets in that. But one thing that they raised during this that some people have asked me that are casual fans or, or just, you know, they just kind of know me or know somebody we've had on the show and they've tuned in a few times is mm -hmm. about the whips. When they say we're going to limit whip or show with jockey use whip, then it gets back into a controversy. Uh, that probably needs a little clarifying because some people say, are they beating the horses? What's this whip all about? I think that's the first instinct of those that are on the outside of horse racing. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to back up a little bit to talk about this because when people say do whips hurt, my answer is no, they don't hurt. Horses don't run into pain. I mean, we've learned over the years that horses, if their leg hurts, they slow down. If they're tooth hurts because they hit it on the starting gate they slow down and if their bum hurts because they're being whipped uh, too vigorously um, or too aggressively they're going to slow down as well but i will say we've come a long way i think there was a time when people used to think that yeah if you hit them harder they'll run faster well we've also learned when we're training our dogs that they learn through positive reinforcement and we've learned this with the horses too they learn through positive reinforcement so over the years the riding crop has become more and more I don't want to say gentle, but less severe. Let's say that it's become less severe. And so that it does make a loud popping noise, but it's really more just to startle them than it is to to hurt them. And also keep in mind that they, they are very thick skinned. So, you know, we brand a cow unsedated and their right. skin is about the same as a cow's. And so in order to be able to to hurt a horse, you know, with, with a strike like that, it would take somebody who probably weighs a bit more than the hundred pounds that the jockeys weigh in, in some sort of a riding crop that would be a bit more severe. And again, our riding crops did used to be a bit more severe than they are now, but we've learned over the years, we have now what we call the cushion crop. Mm -hmm. And so it's got a actually padded popper. That's the end part of the, uh, the riding crop that actually hits the horse. And while it does make it a loud poppy noise, it doesn't hurt them. And I, I actually like to compare it to a personal fitness trainer. And so if you're at the gym and you're working out and you're training hard for any sort of a competition that you have coming up and you have your personal fitness trainer there and, you know, you're getting to your max reps, they're there going, come on, you can do this. You've got this. You've got it. <laughs> yeah. And really, that's what the jockey is doing with the riding crop. They're like, come on, buddy, pay attention. No, don't drift out that way. And so they might hit them a couple of times on the right side. And then if they go to drift in, switch the crop over to their left hand. No, not that way either. Go straight. <laughs> Come on, you've got this. I'm right here with you. I'm tired too, but I'm still trying. Yeah. So this is sort of, this is what the jockey is doing. And again, if the riding crop hurt them, they wouldn't be running faster. They'd, been slowing, they'd be slowing down. That is the best explanation I've heard. And, and <laughs> well, seriously, thank and thank you, because... 
I, you know, uh, look, I know they got a lot of problems out there, but I thought they really muddied the water with the press release about the whips and the medication. And because now you've got people that are coming in from the Washington Post and New York Times that don't cover horse racing, and mm-hmm. they should talk to you just what you said about the whip. Because otherwise mm-hmm. they're saying they're whipping horses. What's this? You know how it goes. You, you've been around enough. You know that there's a, there's a segment out there that are hoping to find something bad about the sport. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I and I get it too. By the way, I mean, a kid comes to the races and and loves the horses, and then all of a sudden sees the jockey striking the horse with the the riding crop, and I can see why the first thing they would say is, "Does that hurt?" But it's the same way if you're out with your dog and your dog is on a leash, and all of a sudden your dog goes to chase after a squirrel, and that's not allowed, and you yank back on that training collar, reminding your dog of expected behavior. Now we keep our dogs on leashes because. We want to make sure that they stay between the fences, so to speak, and don't (laughs) chase squirrels and run in front of cars. And so I feel like there's a certain safety standard that is met with carrying the riding crop because horses, they're just like young kids or like your dog outside on a leash. They're easily distracted. And so to take away the riding crop would be like saying, okay, I'll tell you what, you can take your kids to the amusement park and you can be there all day long and you can go for free, (laughs) but you're not allowed to discipline your kids the whole time you're there. Right. <laughs> I don't think anybody's going to buy into that. They're, Not at all. No, no, thank you. But here's <laughs> the other thing. You know, people say we're, we're making these horses run like uh, human athletes going to make the choice of whether they're going to run or not. But the horses don't. Well, that's wrong because I've ridden long enough. And right. uh, as you know, my husband trained to know that we actually do get thoroughbreds into the barn who don't want to run. And guess what? We don't race them because it's impossible to make a horse who doesn't want to run, run. In fact, you would have better luck getting a three-year-old kid to run in a race he didn't want to run in because at least you could maybe take away, you know, well, you're not going to get dessert for the next month and you're not going to get to play with any of your toys, so you could persuade them. But if you had a three-year-old colt who didn't want to load in the starting gate and run the race, good luck making that happen. (laughs) Well put, exactly the way exactly the way it is out there. Of course, Donna's husband, Frankie Brothers, great horseman, one of the one of the true gentlemen in the business. And the next time you're on, I want you to be on with I want to talk about you and your mom and, and maybe get everybody you guys on because um, Julie Crone was on a couple of shows ago and just spoke highly of you and your mom Patty and, and just about the trailblazing that all of you did and how, you know, one thing led to another to another. To, to get to the sport now where you don't go, wow, there's a, a female jockey. I didn't know they still had female <laughs> jockeys, you know, and it's your time. Yeah. And certainly when your mom was riding, it's like this, it was such a, it was a novelty. And, uh, and I think that that's come a long way and you're a big part of that. Well, and one of the reasons why there's so much talk about it this year, and thank you for that, but it's the 50 year anniversary of the, uh, 1969 yeah. was the first year that women were actually, um, uh, Kathleen, Kathy Kustner got the license in 1968 and the right to ride, but nobody rode in their first race until 1969. And so this is the 50 year anniversary of, of that having happened. And so on April 20th, my mom, my sister, and a bunch of our friends, and um, yeah, quite a few of us, I think like 20 of us are going to spend the day at Keeneland, really just there to recognize my mother's, you know, huge accomplishment. I mean, 50 years ago, oh, yeah. maybe not on that day, but certainly in that it was in the spring of 1969 that she rode in her first races and she won her first race in May, um, at a recognized racetrack and, and Keeneland's even going to, um, have mom do a trophy presentation for one of the races, which oh, is really nice. That, that is nice. And if you have a chance, go by and say hello to her and to say hello to Donna too, if you're in the Lexington, Kentucky area that day, cause I think that's, yeah, that's, that's well-deserved. And, and, yeah, and Donna's really very friendly, by the way. She's a TV star with NBC, <laughs> but she will talk to you. I've, I've seen her do that. Unlike Kenny Rice, who just puts his nose in the air when people walk up. <laughs> you know, I'm you, just kidding. You know what? You might get this. I get this every year at the Derby. I mean, I'm telling you, every year. Some people even I don't know, and every now and then a few friends will say, saw you at the Derby. I said, hello, you didn't speak to me. I go, well, you know, I had like 30 seconds to go talk to Baffert or 25 seconds to talk to this guy or get someplace. And I'll bet it's that way with you. You're riding out there on your horse. Everybody think, oh, there's Donna riding on her horse. Hey, Donna, Donna, I'm over here. Look at me. You yes. know, hell no, you've, well, got, the, you've got less than a minute to get in position before the race starts. Not just that. On the big days like Derby and, and Breeders' Cup and uh, if, if we have a triple crown on the line, I'll use a double earpiece. So I'll oh, actually yeah. have the show in both ears because 
the crowd noise sometimes when you're out there on the horse can be so loud. Right. And I just really need to block all that noise and just hear the show. And so I really just literally cannot hear them saying hello to me because all I hear is program. <laughs> and so then finally they'll like, you know, like really, really, really wave me down and I might see them and then I'll, I'll give them a, a quick glance or a quick wave. And yes, I think sometimes they think that we're being impolite, but really it's just that, um, well, we don't go visit them when they are in the middle of surgery on any patients <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, when they're in the middle of trying a case in front of the lawyer, I mean, in front of the judge. So <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should. <laughs> maybe that'll and work. Get it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Don, I know you got to run. Listen, I always appreciate your time, and I will see you soon. We have a few things coming up, a three-day event, and, of course, the Triple Crown on NBC that we work together, and I always love to see you. You know that. Yep, and it's always fun, Kenny, and it's always good to talk to you. And, by the way, I've really enjoyed your show. I've, I've listened to or watched many of the episodes, not all of them yet, because you've got so many. You've been prolific, but I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. Donna Brothers, what a wonderful person she is and a great broadcaster with NBC. Of course, you'll see her all over the place on the Triple Crown scene. And we'll be back with more of the Horse Racing Show right after this. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. We're counting it down to the Kentucky Derby. It is a special event. As we talked about, it's a bucket list event. We've had guests on here talking about how special it is and what it means to them in the horse business. What it means to those in the Commonwealth, Kentucky, is pretty much everything. It's a state with a few minor league baseball teams, but the professional sports, they don't have any. The emphasis is on college sports. And the Kentucky Derby is the biggest sporting event of the year in the state. So much so that every TV station, every newspaper, uh, podcast, whatever, will center around it sometimes during the week, maybe for the entire week. One of the stations that does a great job going the whole soup to nuts of the Kentucky Derby is WLEX-TV in Lexington, Kentucky, the NBC affiliate. Their main anchor and the top anchor in the Lexington market is Nancy Cox, a multiple Emmy Award winner who has followed horse racing for many years, and Nancy joins us now. Welcome to the Horse Racing Show. I love the title. You just can't get any more... Ex explanatory than that it's the horse racing we show. try to keep this simple nancy i like it simple is good now simple is not though what you guys <laughs> will be doing at channel 18 the nbc station in lexington derby week because your coverage goes like all week and then derby day uh it, it's like a small network it really is for a television station in this size market to do what we do is pretty spectacular and when we started out doing this in 2000 it wasn't anything like this and it has grown and grown and the desire from sponsors to be a part of that has enabled us to just get bigger and bigger and it's by far it's that one weekend or that one week is bigger than the other 11 months of the year no question you're like me a kentuckian mm -hmm. did you grow up with a an affection for horse racing or is that something that for me it developed it wasn't like i grew up other than I'd watch the Derby on TV, but I wasn't into horse racing until later on in life. With you? My mother never sat around with us watching UK basketball, or she'd maybe watch when Muhammad Ali had a match, but when the Derby came on, everything stopped for my mom. Uh, always on that Saturday, she made sure she was home, she made sure she had dinner made or whatever, and she watched it. And that fascinated me because what made my mom put everything else aside like this? So I don't remember the first derby I watched, uh -huh. and I haven't missed one, watch, at least watching one since. So I grew up knowing there's just something special about this. And like you, the more I was around it, the more I was exposed, that affection for the sport and for these athletes, these animals just grew and grew and I cry every year during my whole Kentucky home now. And every year, they ask us, what, yeah, how do you come up with stories? But every year, the story kind of almost tells itself in some cases. That person that's not supposed to be there, they got right. there with the horse that wasn't supposed to be there. Now they're there. In addition to, I guess, 
you know, and that's why it's a 50-50 split in demographics. I'm probably on Channel 18. It certainly is that way with NBC. You've got men and women watching. So you also have the fashions and right. the food and drink mixed in with the, the human interest. Stories. We actually have more women watching our all-day coverage because we do begin about 5.30 in the morning. And it goes all day until 2.30 when NBC takes over its network coverage. So... Obviously, it's not just about the race for all that. It's, it's more like a festival. It's, it's the whole state's homecoming. And for those people who've never been able to go, it is really Im- remarkable to me for them to be able to sit down and watch all day coverage, whether it be in Lexington or Louisville. The Louisville stations do the same thing. So they get to feel a part of things. I've run into people over the years. There's a lady in Maysville who operates a a miniature um, museum, a museum of miniatures. And they had a a Kentucky Derby display. It was a parlor of one of these big farms after they've won the Derby. And you could see the blanket of roses and the trophy and all that. But anyway, she was that invested in it, but she had never gone to the Derby. Wow. But she told me how important it was to her that she sets her alarm, kind of like the royal wedding. <laughs> <laughs> you set the alarm, you get up, and, and people watch every minute of it. They want to see the fashion and the people and the stories behind the athletes, whether that be the jockeys or the horses, the owners or trainers, where they came from, how they got this dream. As you said, the story always develops. They're always unique backgrounds there so this woman just was just joyful she was bubbling talking about how she could watch it and feel a part of it and she's in her 70s and she said I may never go but I feel like I've been there yeah that's that's wonderful that's what it's about to me because it is a two-minute horse race right and you've got hours of TV coverage we're talking with Nancy Cox the top anchor at the WLAX TV in Lexington the NBC affiliate leading into the NBC coverage of mm-hmm. course of the Derby you know, we're on like NBC. I, we, we do so many hours. I don't even really know how many hours we do. Oh, yeah. I just know I show up and talk a lot. <laughs> Sometimes I talk, you know, say don't talk as much. But, you know, there's always something to cover. But but I do find it it's it, it's the only sporting event I can think of that's so much hype. Maybe the Super Bowl in terms of amount of hours, if you start breaking down mm-hmm. per capita hours compared to actual game time of a Super Bowl, I can't think of. Maybe they do it in some other markets. But I don't know any by any any state outside of Louisville – Inside out Kentucky, outside of Lexington and Louisville that devotes the time they do to the Derby. A little bit in Baltimore. I've been there for the Preakness, Uh and their stations will devote like all day to the Preakness. But I don't think they do like the whole week like Lexington and Louisville stations do. And we're there on Friday for the Oaks, and every newscast beginning at 4.30 in the morning, we have a live presence there and do the majority of our coverage from there. I was just thinking you were talking about the all-day coverage. I remember I was about... (laughs) I don't know, maybe 20, 25 before I realized that the Kentucky Derby wasn't just one race that everybody <laughs> went to. I didn't know there were other races on the court that day because the Derby's all that mattered. I thought everyone just gathered and spent eight, 10 hours <laughs> up it, until I, the race. It kind of seems that way to us. You know, we'll cover a few other races during the course of the day, but let's face it, nobody says, Hey, do you remember who? No, they remember the Derby. They remember the Derby. And and that is what's so special about it. And there you are through wind and sleet and snow and dark of night. Well, we haven't got the dark of night yet. Uh, We, you know, it got pretty dark. It got pretty dark in the Smarty Jones downpour year. I remember in 04. And then last year, the rain all day. I don't ever remember a Derby where it did not let up. I know. I agree. And the Smarty Jones year was just, we didn't have a cover over our broadcast position at that time because that was only about five years into it we'd had decent weather we had no cover my poor hat became like a I don't know like it was made out of putty or something it just kind of drooped and molded to my head and we had tornado watches I believe if not a warning nearby so we had to clear our position because we were not undercover and all the electricity and everything. So we go huddle under this little, I don't know, canopy. And a man beside me, I'll never forget, was just going to town on this cigar. (laughs) And we're all just bunched up in here and he's just blowing smoke right in everybody's face. And I was like, I'm cold, I'm wet, and I'm breathing cigar smoke. 
but it was still the Derby. I would do it again just to be there when those horses uh, come out and, and do the post parade. That's why you win all those Emmy Awards. No, no, I always no. said, put the cigar out. Look, I'm choking <laughs> to death. I'm wet. I was really I'm, close. I'm miserable, <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, and so how much preparation will you do for the Derby now or right about a month out? Yeah. Every year I say I'm going to start a little earlier because we don't know the field really until mm -hmm. just a week before. It's kind of hard to learn much about any of the horses except those maybe top 10. Um, but I do put a lot of time in trying to get those backstories, not just, oh, this horse has won this many races and it was bred here or there, but what are the connections and what are their stories? So I take notes <clears throat> for about that month and I'm continually sort of updating them, organizing them. And certainly because initially when we started this and we were doing this, I don't know, 12 hour coverage yeah. or something, you always had that fear of running out of things to say. So did all that research and had it all. But by now, I'm a little more comfortable with everything about the Derby and our coverage. So I'll, I'll still prep over that period of time, but I'm not memorizing and uh, cr cramming like yeah. for um, a college final. Yeah, and you don't run out of things to say. Um, probably not. Probably Most not. people around me would agree with you. <laughs> yeah, you don't, we don't run out of things to say. You can see Nancy on WLEX TV. If you, if you come to Kentucky that week, you're in Lexington, Louisville, flip on one of the stations. We're not trying to plug anybody in particular, but uh, listen to any of the stations. Naturally, I'm biased to the NBC, NBC. stations, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's amazing, the coverage. And how many people are going to be there for you guys? Because we talked about small network. Right. You know, we've got like 300 people doing the NBC show. Compared to the times you have and the staff you have, it's amazing all the people to be there for LEX. We probably have about 100. Yeah. And many of those are freelancers. We rent a production truck because we just outgrew the equipment we had when we kept expanding mm -hmm. our coverage. So we rent a production truck, and that comes with people we pay to run that. So mm -hmm. it's probably a 100-person with the talent and everything right. all together. And they'll go up a week and a half ahead of time and start physically running cable from that truck mm -hmm. to all these positions inside um, Churchill Downs. I know you all probably have things that stay in place and you come in and just plug into them every year. We don't have that. We have to run those cables to all yeah. those positions. So you have monitors, you have lights, you have microphones, you have intercom so that we can hear and speak to our producers. And then a few of the a simple comforts, <laughs> you know, a chair with a pad in it and um, a raincoat if you need it, plastic if you need to cover. So if you could see what's sitting around me, and I have about this much room to get in there because you have water and you have snacks <laughs> because we don't get to eat right. during that time. So uh, it is a monumental effort. It really is. And our folks, they're amazing. Nobody complains. Well, it's always great to watch the award-winning coverage. I, I do tape it, by the way. Oh, no, you're kidding. I, well, I'm not there. You know, I'm kind of busy that day, yeah, but I do tape bit. it. But I believe you know a member of our staff here. I do? I believe you know Mr. Thomas Kenny, our researcher. Well, yes, I do. I have seen him on, Mr. Thomas Kenny, and... Um, he's very talented. He is, and he's learning a lot about horse racing. Is he here? Yes, hey, look. What a coincidence. Look who has just joined us now. Hi, Mr. Kenny. Hello. So nice to see you at work in the professional setting. I just think he's so cute. Is he, though? Darling. I'm sorry. I wasn't going to do that. Oh, did, you might want to explain this relationship. You're not embarrassed, are you, Thomas? Of course not. Of you got course over not. that a long time ago. That's Thomas's, that's Thomas's <laughs> mom who came up with the idea, and I said, that's great. This is because it fascinates me. I don't know if there's too many places in the country. Do you, Thomas, where... where a local TV station is going to devote like a whole week of coverage and like 10 or 12 hours in one day to one sport. I'm sure somebody does out one there. One event. I just, yeah. One event. I don't know who it would be, but not like Lexington and Louisville, Kentucky does. Mm -hmm. Do you? You know, I, I think of maybe, you know, some of the other huge events, you know, like the Daytona 500 maybe. Mm, yeah, yeah, maybe. Maybe, yeah. Maybe not as extensive. Maybe they don't do a whole yeah. week leading up to it. Right. But yeah, maybe the Indy 500, maybe? Yeah, I, uh, I have a friend who has been in Indiana uh -huh. TV, and I know for them it has been rough, but yeah. we've never compared notes on 
the amount of Well, coverage. it's time we start. We think Kentucky Derby coverage is the best. Oh, I, I would agree there, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you that yes. NBC has encroached upon our territory a few times. We used to do our coverage. What, me? We used to do our coverage from uh, 5.30 in the yeah. morning. Uh-huh. And we would go up until 4, sometimes 4.30 before yeah. NBC got, got in the game. I got tired of that, Nancy. I guess you did. You needed some more airtime. And then we would come back on after you guys finished, and we would do a wrap-up show. And you talked about being out there in the dark. It was almost dark yeah. when we left Churchill Downs. Yeah. Um, NBC thought that was a pretty good plan, so they started do, extending their coverage. But... At least now I get to get out of there and actually watch the Derby. I would love so. to see the Derby someday myself. I bet you would. No, you know what? I watch it off of. I watch it off the big screen. Yeah. I'm down there. I'm down there at the on the floor. Last year I was in the back. Uh, they have a little area there off the paddock. I sit back there with Bob Baffert and I watched it on mm-hmm. the screen. But that's how I watch the yeah. Derby. You know, we're not in a position where we're up in the stands and we get a nice view because you know as soon oh, as yeah. that race is you over, got we got to talk to somebody work. or see what happens. Yeah. You know. For a lot of years, uh, folks at Channel 18, and maybe I've been guilty of that, you kind of, in a way, you dread it because it is a long day. It's a lot of work. You don't get to enjoy the Derby as soon as it's over. Mm -hmm. You go right back to work. But every year, no matter how tired I am or whatever, or how early I've left my kids still sleeping in bed, I get there, and it's hours before the Derby, and you just, the air is different. Yeah, it is. The energy is different. And all that complaining just gone. Yeah. yeah. Do you watch your mom? Yeah, for the Derby. Good, good, good answer. <laughs> for years, though, where did you watch the Derby? Do you recall when you were playing baseball? No. No? Well, when you were playing at Southeastern Baseball, when you were um, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Yeah, about that tall. <laughs> They would always have ball games Derby Day and during oh, yeah. the Derby, and finally they started putting up a screen at Southeastern Baseball Park. Well, there's there's and priorities. Thomas was catching; he had to throw runners out, had to get hits, know, right? and he couldn't really worry about who's Saving in the winner's circle. Do, walk off doubles, that yeah. kind of thing. You didn't think I remembered, <laughs> yeah. did you? Yeah, <laughs> but they would watch on the big screen. Oh, I like that. Do you ever want to go to the Derby? I'm not opposed to it. Well, yeah. we, you know, we're going to be on location, by the way, at Churchill Downs the week before the oh, Derby. That's great. Yeah, Thomas will You'll be up there. Ben will be there. Scott wonder. Hall will be there. Nancy, thank you for being with us. It's a pleasure. Sorry if I rambled. No, you didn't. Sorry if I embarrassed you. <laughs> Did she embarrass you? <laughs> of course not. Of course not. <laughs> Nancy Cox, great job. Watch her when you're passing through Lexington or watch the Derby coverage. That's why she wins all the Emmy Awards, and that is WLEX TV. The Derby's a big deal. We're going to talk more about it again next week. Uh, again, thank you so much, Nancy. And right now, it is time for our Rude and Riddle Vet Check. And welcome in now, Dr. Scott Morrison. Uh, if you want to know about the horse's foot, I would ask Scott Morrison, really. And this time of the year especially, uh, you'll hear horses on the Derby Trail. Quarter cracks comes up a lot. What is a quarter crack? Uh, no better expert than Scott to talk about it. Dr. Morrison, thank you for being with us. What is a quarter crack exactly out there for the layman? Yeah, yeah well, quarter crack is, you know, basically we divide the foot into different regions. You have the toe and the heel, and then you got the, you know, between the toe and the heel, you have the quarter. So, you know, a quarter crack is a, is a crack in the quarter region, you know, as opposed to a toe crack or a heel crack. And uh, quarter cracks typically occur at the hairline. You know, they start up at the coronary band. You know, so a lot of people falsely categorize cracks that are on the ground surface as quarter cracks if they're in the quarter, but those are more more properly referred to as sand cracks or weather cracks. But, you know, true quarter crack is up at the coronary band, and they're usually full thickness, and they bleed. So they're, you know, they're kind of a serious deal. It irritates, obviously. It, it affects training. Uh put patches over it to cover it, try to get everything. Because let's face it, what you, pretty much your knees, your back, your feet, for any athlete, human or equestrian, you, you need those. How, how tough is it to treat a quarter crack and get the horse ra- back on the track in racing? Yeah, uh, that, that's variable because, you know, it depends. Uh, you know, it depends on the conformation of the foot and how healthy the rest of the foot is. You know, usually horses that have quarter cracks typically have a kind of a lower compromised heel. 
you know, so some of them could be pretty straightforward. You could patch them and, and put a special shoe on to, to unweight the area and you can get them through, you know, and kind of continue on training and, and racing. You know, the only complications are is if, you know, if one's been festering for a while and, uh, and has an infection in there as well, you know, that'll, that'll delay things. And, you know, infections, you can't just treat overnight, you know, a clean crack that's just, you know, not infected. You can just patch and, mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, pack off the bed of the crack so there's no glue or anything touching the sensitive tissue, and, and that usually suffices, and you can go on. But if there's an infection or something that brews in there, that can certainly delay things. That's, that just takes time. To, there's no way to speed up, you know, cleaning up the infection. We put them on antibiotics and, and soak the foot and put topical antiseptics on and things like that, but that that's going to delay it without a doubt. Uh, the, you're uh, a farrier, back. right? So you're also a farrier and a veterinarian. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a farrier and a vet. Yep. I mean, I yep. I can't think of a better thing to become a vet than be a farrier when you're working on feet. I mean, it's a natural, yeah. isn't it? Oh, uh, it's coming really handy. In my yeah, it's coming really handy having knowledge of the foot because you know there's a lot of a lot of health and medical conditions of the foot. So you know, being a farrier certainly helps me deal with those problems. You hear about trainers changing shoes sometimes with a quarter crack or other things, especially shoes with a racing horse. Uh, how valuable is that good shoe? Is I guess like with us, if you got a bad shoe, you get a blister on your foot. If you go out even for a half a mile jog, yeah, changing changing shoes is imperative. You know, you know, we, the race horses are asked to be in their 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 competition shoes all day long, all night. You know, they're in their basically in their cleats. So you can imagine if you had to wear your cleats, your golf shoes all day long, you you know, probably wouldn't be the best thing. You'd want to take them off and put something else on. So I mean, it's one of the negative consequences of you know shoeing horses for their athletic use. You know, so when they do have a problem, we try to try to bring the foot back to a more natural condition. Put something on that loads the frog and other structures. So typically, when a horse has a, a quarter crack, you'll hear of people putting a shoe on with frog support or a hard bar or maybe a bar shoe. Uh, sometimes you'll hear a Z bar shoe. That's a that's a shoe that has a a little frog support plate on it and then there's a quarter of the shoe that's cut out so that area under the crack is just unweighted and there's no shoe under there so it's kind of basically floated in the air and and unweights it um those are some shoes you probably hear about on horses being treated with quarter cracks another shoe is a, a three-quarter shoe they call it it's basically a regular horse shoe where they they cut the heel out of that quarter of the shoe so that part of the foot's unweighted that way as well so you know Quarter cracks are, uh, you know, they you know, they occur. They're just a, you know, consequence of you know kind of the sport they do and the, and the shoes they have to wear. And you know, like anything else with horse health care, you know, the further you get from, you know, what's natural from them, you know, whether, you know, th- th- having to wear shoes has negative consequence. So, you know, when they have a problem, we try to bring it back to what's natural for the foot, a natural loading pattern to the foot. You know, try to mimic that barefoot condition that they were intended to be in, and that. Things typically heal well when you try to bring them back to, to nature a little bit or what's natural for them. Scott, thanks for being on with us. People will be hearing about quarter cracks, I'm sure, during the Derby and Triple Crown runs on horses. Now you know a little bit more about them. Dr. Scott Morrison, thank you for being with us on the Vet Check from Rudin Riddle. Yes, yeah, you're welcome. All Appreciate right. It. We'll be back with more of the Horse Racing Show right after this. Again, thanks for tuning in this week to the Horse Racing Show. We appreciate your time and your support. Doug O'Neill, Donna Brothers, Nancy Cox, thanks for being with us as well. We talked hockey. Well, we talked it with Doug. We were talking about big upsets. Ben Chaffins liked uh, the Miracle on Ice, which was not the gold medal game. That was Thomas Kenny for the U.S., who they had to beat to win gold. Had to beat Finland. Had to beat Finland. See? Look at that. But everybody remembers the Russian game. Mm Mm-hmm. That's just like it doesn't matter what happens now, unless you are a trainer or you own the horse. It's what happens when you get to that first Saturday in May. That's what everybody will be remembering, won't they? To be fair, Russia, or the Soviet Union at the time, had won five out of those last six oh, gold medals that's in right. hockey. That's right. So that was a pretty big deal. Yeah, that was huge. Maybe the biggest upset in U.S. sports history in many ways. Yeah, not, not just Olympic sports. Will there be an upset at the Derby this year? Hmm. 
Saw an upset last week. Maximum security in the Florida Derby. Big races this weekend, including game winner back in action. Is he the one to beat in the Santa Anita Derby? We'll talk more about that next week. Join us again for the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. Thanks for tuning in.